Hi, this is the Fictional Mind Bender, and today I'm going to be talking about the philosophy that I see in the city of Gotham as it's portrayed in the Nolan Batman trilogy. Now, anyone and their grandmother knows the name Gotham City. You don't have to be a huge Batman fan to know that this is where Batman, Batman resides and does his crime fighting. And anyone who's really familiar with um, the character or the lore or the comic books and whatever knows that Gotham City is just as much a character in that universe as Batman himself. It's almost like this, in a, I guess you can say, invisible divine presence, if you will, that hovers in and over the environment that all the, all the characters in that realm interact in. And at the same time, on some sort of unspoken, I guess you could almost say psychic level, kind of speaks to you about uh, just what the nature of that world is. One that's hard, that's cold, and that is, if you make it, you're good and you're kind of on the top tier and separate, but if you don't, you're on the bottom and kind of have to fight for yourself or die. And the Nolan trilogy does this with Gotham City, but does it in a different way, in that, well, yes, the trilogy is about Batman, at the same time, it is also about the fall and resurrection of Gotham City itself. And let me explain. So, you have in Batman Begins the origin of Bruce Wayne and how he comes to, as everyone knows, lose his parents, um, goes to a far off location where he is trained by the League of Shadows, which is basically a group of assassins slash ninjas, I guess you'd call them, and is going to take part in their plan to destroy Gotham City because that's what they do. They are the judge, juries, and executioners of societies that have fallen too far off the moral path. Uh, Bruce rejects this path and eventually uh, tries to take down the League of Assassins himself, um, and after he does so, he goes back to Gotham, uh, takes on the mantle of Batman, to fight crime and try to save Gotham in his own way that doesn't involve killing a bunch of people. Now, the leader of the League, Ra's al Ghul, um, survives Bruce's attempt to take down the organization. He rebuilds it. He comes back years later, um, tries to bring it down again. There's an obvious confrontation. Batman seems to win, and that it ends on the moral high note that Gotham City is full of innocent people that had nothing to do with its corruption and that need protection while at the same time um, it needs help in saving itself because it is you know corrupt as fuck and for the most part that's very cookie cutter generic superhero philosophy there you know yes things are bad but not everyone is bad or it's not all bad and that taking things to an extreme is a bad way to go about that. Let's find a different way to, to deal with this. However, um, where things go south starts with the Dark Knight. Taking place years later, um, Batman is now famous to everyone in Gotham. Um, he's pretty much given a blank card, so to speak, as to how he wants to handle the criminal um, denizens of Gotham City, as long as they kill anybody, um, the cops give him a free pass, and he's working with Commissioner Gordon as well. Um, he is feared by the underworld, and people see him as a hero, even though most of them have never seen him before. They just know about him. He has become a myth, I guess. The fight on crime is then joined by Harvey Dent, who is a up and rising lawyer who is also courting uh, Bruce Wayne's ex, as it turns out. And they form basically a trinity, so to speak, of law. Uh, the trinity of justice, I guess you can say. And their job basically is to ultimately rid Gotham of the corruption that Rachel Gould in the last movie had thought made it worthy of destruction. Sometime during this point, Bruce Wayne decides that um, the time is approaching to kind of lay down a mantle and just have someone else kind of deal with it. And the problem he's having is that he can't find anybody else. He sees a lot of pretenders trying to be him and everything, but they keep going too far, using excessive violence 
and being more of a danger to themselves than they are to uh, the criminal underworld. However, uh, in Harvey Dent, um, Batman finally sees someone who can become his successor. Well, at the same time, getting his girlfriend back. Nice. Speaking of corruption. And the movie pretty much revolves around how the Joker, who I talked about in another video, enters into this fray, basically, and completely upends things. He essentially starts breaking taboos and expectations about who was a target and who was not a target, targeting civilians, cops, you name it, and blaming Batman for the whole thing, which eventually leads the people to, and the cops, to turn, start turning on Batman, which during the famous interrogation scene, the Joker flat out tells him was going to happen in the first place, and the movie ultimately ends with uh, the people of Gotham choosing not to finally give in to the Joker's claims that the point of life is just chaos and Batman seemingly capturing the Joker but Harvey Dent in the process is killed because the Joker broke him uh, before Gotham could be saved and that because of the importance that he would that he had on the city that this secret is kept from the public that Harvey Dent had died at the hands of the Joker. Instead, they decided to blame Batman for it, which Batman had agrees to because it was his idea to begin with, and he becomes kind of a martyr in order to protect someone who is a false martyr, I guess you can say. Now, as many YouTubers have already pointed out, <laughs> I'm sure at this point, this movie is loaded with philosophy. I mean, just fucking loaded. So I'm gonna try and keep it simple in terms of what was important to me, what stood out to me, what made it different. And the first one being that how it slowly starts to show how Gotham is corrupting its saviors. Okay, and you, and you, th you see this in Batman himself um, on, the first, on the first go, that he is willing to go behind Harvey Dent's back who trusts him, mind you, even though he doesn't know he's Bruce Wayne, in order to get his ex back. Her, her name's Rachel. And he's willing to do almost whatever it takes in order to achieve that. And Rachel's kind of put into this point where she has to choose, basically, who she's going to go with. Um, either the Dark Knight or Gotham's White Knight, as it were. Also, too, you see the corruption in the cops, even though it's a corruption that both they and I think we as the audience pretty much uh, justify that you know instead of hunting down a vigilante because Batman is a vigilante they instead work with him and flat out lie about him and everyone know it's funny because everyone in Gotham knows that they're lying about you know how they're handling you know fighting Batman and yet it's acceptable because as the Joker points out it's still within the social norms of what's expected to happen to certain people. It hasn't crossed that line yet. And this is complemented by the fact that, again, everyone know in Gotham knows that Batman is a vigilante and that what he does is illegal. And no one questions the legality of this. No one seriously really pursues this up until the Joker starts bringing in casualties, um, where he starts introducing people who are supposed to be outside of the violence into the violence and now their plot armor is gone so when the joker is initially kind of targeting um the main players of gotham city with the exception of batman himself that is the cops the judges the politicians what have you he's essentially tackling where the corruption is at its greatest basically and ironically and in doing so reveals just how fragile not only Gotham City's morality is but their, how their sense of justice is and how it essentially is all a big joke and that for this reason even Batman falls into that trap which is why I think anyway he's able to play Batman for the entire almost the entirety of the movie up until the end because Batman is playing within those same social expectations even though he's not technically a part of it because he's a vigilante. And it's only till the end where he starts to push that and steps outside of that, almost to the point where the Joker has, 
that he's able to finally defeat him. And yet, even then, that doesn't work entirely because the Joker already got to Harvey Dent, recognizing from the beginning that Harvey Dent was the linchpin that was holding it all together. And Gordon and Batman recognizing that far too late. And then the Dark Knight ends on the public and the police turning on Batman for basically doing what he has been doing for the past few years. Again, exposing just how morally uh, corrupt the city is. So instead of ending on a high point like the last movie, Batman Begins, it starts going on this low point where a bunch of ungrateful people who were fine with what Batman did beforehand now have a problem with him because now there's escalation, now there's casualties, now there's um, taboos and red lines that are being crossed that they themselves already crossed before the Joker even showed up. And that even corrupted Batman slash Bruce Wayne himself um, in the vise of Rachel Dawes and his relationship with her and her, and her eventual death. Cue the third movie um, of, the, of the Nolan trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises, and it's about eight years after the end of The Dark Knight. And Bruce Wayne has retired as Batman, who is now considered a criminal. Gordon is now Commissioner Gordon instead of just a cop. And um, through what's been called the Dent Act, um, he's able to return some semblance of order back to Gotham City um, before the Joker entered into the picture. But again, all of this is built in a lie, and the show establishes early on that this whole thing is a lie. This whole thing is, is an illusion, basically. And it takes the new antagonist, or I should say the returning antagonist, the League of Shadows, under the leadership of a villain known as Bane, to expose this and finally break Gotham City. And I'll spare you the details, but essentially the bad guys win for most of the movie. Um, Gotham City is finally taken down. They set up a booby trap so that if anyone tries to come in and save it from the outside world, they're going to nuke the city even though apparently they're going to nuke it anyway um, because that was the original plan of Ra's al Ghul in the first place and um, Batman's taken out of the picture um, he tries to come back into it, seems like he's all that but um, ends up getting his ass kicked by Bane and sent to God knows where in the prison where um, he has to rehabilitate, excuse me, rehabilitate, rehabilitate himself and review I think his morality and his philosophy which is where I'm going to get into now. So from the beginning um, the League of Shadows plan was to first expose Gotham to the lies that it was built on or that it had become built on and it does that through number one removing Batman's toys as it were when they raid uh, Bruce Wayne's company and basically steal all his cars which God, that was hard. That was hurtful because I love the Tumblr. I really love the Tumblr, so that was bad to watch for me. Other than that, though, secondly, um, the next thing he does is that he takes over a football field after killing most of the football players on the fucking field and basically exposes um, the lie of what happened to Harvey Dent to the public. So now everyone knows what really went down and that the person that they were worshipping and making all these laws off of the entire time was actually a villain and a fraud and the person who they thought was a villain and a fraud was actually the hero. <laughs> okay, so it fucked that whole thing up. And then after that it takes the police force and makes them defunct, trapping most of them underground and the rest of them being hunted down and either sent to execution by drowning in an icy river or that they just stay in their homes and stay out of, the, out of the way because they're going to die anyway once the city blows up. That's the setting of The Dark Knight Rises. So basically at this point, Gotham has fallen. The corruption that Ra's al Ghul had spoken about has come to pass and it has come to its full fruition and now everyone knows about it and there's no hiding uh, from it anymore by anybody. And ironically, this is topped off with Bruce Wayne having a vision of Ra's al Ghul appear to him, basically 
chastising him, telling him, I told you so, essentially. But basically that, you know, yeah, you thought that, you know, you being morally superior was going to save the city, and it didn't. And instead you became part of the problem. So yeah, now, so now the city needs to die. It's going to die. And Bruce Wayne still can accept this. And Gordon, who is one of the cops in hiding, um, is basically called out by uh, one of his younger cops um, for being a part of this lie. And even though Gordon tries to defend himself, and you could argue defended himself pretty well because, you know, it's like, what would you do if you were in that situation? But at the same time, um, it's basically saying that any kind of moral right that you had was gone once you agreed to this lie. And that you put a bunch of people in jail, criminals as they were, based on a lie. So, there you are. As one author named Greg Rocha um, said, um, you have to accept Batman is a fact of life in Gotham City. And on top of that, you have to accept that somehow the city, G, excuse me, the city manages to function with a police force that's 90% corrupt. Oh, God. And that's essentially what the trilogy is about. It's about how this corruption nearly destroys Gotham City and the people who live there, including Batman himself. That it literally took um, a series of calamities you know, from Ra's al Ghul to the Joker to his League of Assassins later on to expose that so that the people could then rise up above that Dark Knight Rises and become better, become that uh, beacon of hope or whatever that everyone was saying that Gotham had. Because up until that point, it wasn't there. Because everything was built on a lie or that people were making... Um, cuts and everything in order to make it look like that they're at that point. And in a way, this kind of comes back home to Batman himself in that he realizes that, okay, yes, everything was built in a lie and in order to really resolve the situation, he's going to, he's going to have to die, essentially. And he kind of falls back to what he says in the first movie of uh, that he has to become a myth and a legend in the minds of the people. Uh, so that that can take root and heart in their psyche, in the, in the psyche of Gotham City, and that that hopefully helps to counterbalance, you know, the evil and the corruption that goes on in Gotham, which is what happens in at the end of The Dark Knight Rises, where he flies the nuclear bomb out to sea to set it off. And in everyone's mind, Batman is dead, and it essentially makes him a martyr. And even though someone does rise to take his place, and again, the cops are in on it, at this point, the corruption has been cleansed. And it's been cleansed, ironically, through the quote-unquote death of Batman. And that is the philosophical genius, I think, of the, of the Nolan trilogy, is the fall and rise of Gotham City through its portrayal of Batman and the people around him. If you have any different ideas or have any other thoughts you want to add to that, feel free to comment below. But otherwise, this is the fictional Mindbender, and y'all have a good day.